church with us. Thank you. I don't want to yell. I hope that's okay. But I welcome everybody. It's so nice to see familiar faces coming to the church. We want to let our members know and anyone out in our community that we do have uh, space. We're still social distancing and wearing our masks, but we still have space. So we're praying that as our members become uh, to get their COVID shots or whatever and things get safer, that they'll feel comfortable and slowly coming back. And we're beginning to see that and we're very blessed for that. You know, during this time right now, it's called, some churches call it Easter Tide, or it can be just the Easter season, which starts from the moment when Christ is resurrected to the, uh, to the uh, Pentecost. And during that time, Jesus was walking the face of the earth, and he was working with his disciples and showing miracles, but also he was teaching people how to be church how to go out and spread the word of God and, and the great gift of Jesus Christ. And fortunately, because of that, every Sunday we're able to come together and worship God and also be renewed so that we are also able to go out and let the world know about the love of Jesus Christ and the comfort that he gives us every day. And for that, I and know as you as well are very, very grateful for and We thank you for this beautiful day today as well. So if you all will stand and uh, join our choir today as we sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, we're going to be doing verses 1 and 3, and you can see it on our screen as well. So if you please rise. <laughs> Amen. You may be seated. Just a public service announcement. You may have seen the slide that was just up there. It's a reminder that, you know, when we are with each other to wear a mask and to observe social distancing, I don't think anybody in this room needs to be reminded of that, so you know, please don't be insulted. But we certainly want people who are watching to know that we are being very careful so that they feel safe to come and join us. Uh, so, beautiful day to be in the Lord's house, is it not? Hopefully the rain has washed some of the pollen out of the air and has made it a little easier for us to breathe. And it's just a blessing to see so many faces once again. Like three Sundays in a row, we've had people sh uh, show up for the first time in a year or so. And today we welcome Betty Huff back. It's such a joy to have you with us again. And uh, did I miss anybody? I think that may be all for today, but I know that we have uh, more people coming back for the first time next Sunday, if all goes as planned, and so little by little, we're getting through this, but we uh, also, you know, just want to continue to be mindful that though most of us are getting vaccinated, it, uh, there still are plenty of others who have not, so, you know, we'll keep observing the rules of social distancing and wearing masks and all that just as a precaution 
and uh, that way we will instill confidence in uh, those who are worshiping with us and those who would like to. That being said, there is a new strain, the or the strain, the British strain, that seems to be catching on here, and it seems to be more contagious and uh, attacking younger and younger people. So let's not be dil- let's not lose our diligence in our prayer uh, for the safety and well-being of our country, for the uh, improvement of our uh, vaccination process, and so on. But we do go before the throne of an all-powerful and mighty God, creator of the universe, and giver of life. So with that in mind, let us now approach God's throne in prayer, and let us lift up in him all of our joys, our sorrows, our cares, and our concerns. O oh God, your son remained with his disciples after his resurrection, teaching them to love all people as neighbors. As his disciples in this age, we offer our prayers on behalf of the world in which we are privileged to live with our neighbors and for all those with whom we share. Open our hearts to your power moving around us and between us and within us until your glory is revealed in our love of both friend and enemy in communities transformed by justice and compassion and in the healing of all that is broken and now hear us as we unite our prayers with those of all believers in all times in that prayer which you taught your disciples our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. It's a sign of grace of God that we have what we have, and it's giving back to what he has given us. So we, we pray that we will all have a giving heart. Um, so now if we bow our heads, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day, for the gifts that you've given us, for the ability to be able to walk into this church, to turn on our computers and to watch a, a, a service, dear God, and, and always know that you are there, your spirit is here, and that we always have the protection and grace of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, may we give our gifts to you with a loving heart, dear God, and with great humility and appreciation for all the things that you do for us. These things rest in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And now as we approach the time of communion, we remember our Lord who was crucified, buried, but has risen again. And not only before his death, burial, and resurrection did he observe this meal with his disciples, but also directly after his resurrection. We come to this table to remember the death of Jesus, but in a way we're also remembering his resurrection. We know that Jesus is our host here at this table, so in coming we remember that he lives with us in this very moment. Come to the table remembering the Christ who came to us, who showed us how to live, who died for us, and who lives with us now and forever. And now for the words of institution. For I have received of the Lord what I have also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Lord, as we take up this bread and as we give it to our cup, we remember that you are the bread of life and the water of life. You feed our souls, you nourish our hearts, and you give us substance to grow the race before us. Thanks be to God. Amen. And if you would, those of you who are here, if you have the disposable cup, do you peel back the top layer of plastic and release the wafer that is contained therein? Let us partake of the wafer as we remember the body of our Lord Jesus. And now peeling back the foil. Let us take of the cup as we remember the blood of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Now it's time for our scripture reading, and today's scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 32. And if you'd like to look on the screen or read in your Bible, you can follow along. Now on that same day, the two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had just happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astonished us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they could not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of, excuse me, a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow to heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer through these things and then enter into this glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he inter interpreted them the things about himself and all of the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he was going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I choose love in the midst of pain, sorrow falling down like rain. I await the sun again. I choose love. I choose love. I choose love. Have y'all noticed that uh, over the months, over the last year or so, Robert just gets more confident and stronger in his singing as he gets up there? It's a super job. Before I begin, I want to make sure that we are recording. I have a sense that we are not online. Are we online? We are online. Okay. Because I kept pulling up Facebook on my phone and I couldn't see the, the broadcast. I was a little worried that it wasn't on. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we do have the dream team back here today. We have four people in, uh, in our AV team today, which is wonderful. So uh, we'll talk more about that later. I just want to make sure we were getting a recording one way or the other, just in case. So good. Wonderful. Now, let's see if my heart rate goes down. A little. Oh, yeah, a little bit, maybe. That's what the Fitbit is for, right? I'm hoping that uh, pretty much all of us can remember a TV show called The Jeffersons. You guys remember The Jeffersons? Okay, I figured as much, but I always have to assume that somebody does it, somebody who's here or somebody who's watching. So just a little bit of a background, just a refresher course here. So if you don't remember The Jeffersons, it was a 1970s sitcom, and it featured a successful black family from Queens, New York, who moved on up to Manhattan. Of course, those of you who know the show, you probably also remember that it was one of many successful sitcoms that were founded by Norman Lear, uh, such as Sanford and Son and Good Times and All in the Family. Personally, I miss these Norman Lear shows because I don't think there's really anything quite like them today. And it's my understanding that they have actually become premium content. You actually now have to subscribe to like Stars or HBO or one of those networks in order to get access to these shows. But the aim of this show, like many of the Norman Lear shows, was to use the sitcom or the situation comedy as a vehicle for raising awareness of the many social issues, the very complex issues that America was facing back in the 70s and the 80s. But we first meet the Jeffersons on the show All in the Family, and if you, you know that one, but we always called it Archie Bunker. We didn't call it All in the Family. We called it Archie Bunker. And we watched that show as the Jeffersons, or George in particular, became a very successful businessman. He owned a, a series of dry cleaners, and they became very successful. And through that, he and Edith, I'm sorry, he and Louise and their son Lionel moved up from that working class community into the upper class of Manhattan. And therefore, the spinoff show was created, The Jeffersons. And needless to say, they covered a host of, of social issues over their 11 years, including uh, racism, social class, education, and many, many more. And then there was episode, season four, episode three, entitled, Once a Friend just by the title. Anybody remember that episode, Once a Friend? Okay. In this episode, George is excited to find out that an old Navy pal named Eddie is in town and wants him to stop by his hotel room for a visit. What George doesn't know is that Eddie is now Edie. Because Eddie Back in those days, they called it a sex change operation. Today, we call it gender affirmation surgery. Meanwhile, being a situation comedy, <laughs> confusion ensues. Louise finds out that George is going to a hotel room to meet with somebody named Edie Stokes. So she calls the room and finds out, yes, it's not Eddie Stokes, it's Edie Stokes. She thinks something suspicious is going on. Of course, 
Uh, so she threatens George. She's going to kick him out of the apartment. Uh, and he's going to have to find another place to live. So the way he decides to resolve the controversy is he invites, he begs Edie to come to the apartment to meet Louise and try to convince her that this is a misunderstanding, that Edie used to be Eddie and that this is an old Navy buddy and so forth. But Louise refuses to be convinced until Edie reveals the secret uh, what is it, the secret uh, nickname that Wheezy had for George when he was in the Navy. She would write him letters, and he would receive them. And what did she refer to him as? Her fuzzy wuzzy teddy bear. With these words, Louise was able to recognize Edie as George's friend and not some strange woman. Today's reading from the Gospel of Luke takes, a, takes us into another episode on Easter Sunday. Two of Jesus' followers are traveling on the road to a town called Emmaus. They are so occupied with all the events that surrounded this week that they don't recognize Jesus as he comes along and walks with them. Isn't that strange? They are talking about Jesus, with Jesus, but do not recognize him. How can this be? Well, it seems that some of his other followers and even his closest disciples had the same problem. In Mark chapter 16, verses 12 through 13, we read the following words. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking in the country, and they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. This is like the one-sentence version or the two-sentence version of the text from Luke that Marcia just read for us. In the Gospel of John, we have two more very similar episodes. Uh, the first one takes place when the women come to the tomb to embalm Jesus' body. They find that the tomb is empty and in chapter 20, verses 11 through 16, we read the following words. Mary stood outside, sorry, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken my, away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Just like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Mary saw Jesus, spoke to Jesus, and still did not recognize him. That is, until he spoke her name. Something was different, but also something was the same about this Jesus. In the next chapter in the Gospel of John, the last chapter in the Gospel, we find many of the disciples back on the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. What are they doing? What they did before they met Jesus. They're fishing. And all night long, they catch nothing. And the next morning, they see this mysterious figure on the shore after these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias and he showed himself in this way gathered there together with Simon, were Simon Peter Thomas called the twin Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee 
the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to him, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. How many times had the disciples been with Jesus on the Sea of Galilee? Why did they follow the advice of this mysterious stranger to cast their nets on the other side of the boat when they had been fishing all night and they did not recognize who it was speaking to them? And then, after the large haul of fish, they finally recognized who this was. It was Jesus. So here we see a pattern, these post-resurrection events. Jesus is risen from the dead. He appears to some of his followers. They do not recognize him even though they see him. Now, did you see that in the three passages, the four passages that we read? They saw him, but they did not recognize him. Until what? Until he took the bread and blessed it and broke it. Then they recognized him. Until he said to Mary, he called her name Mary. Then she recognized him. Or until he performed this miracle of telling them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. And then they recognized him. Three resurrection appearances. Same Jesus, but something was different. What was it? I think the answer is what we might call the resurrection body. The resurrection body. It's a term we don't use a lot, but I think it's very important here. And it is especially important to emphasize the word resurrection. Because there is a difference between a resurrection and a resuscitation. You see... A resuscitation is where a body dies, but it is brought back to life, but it will die again eventually. So this describes what happened to Lazarus. You may recall in John chapter 11, Jesus is told that Lazarus is sick. He delays. Finally, he goes, and, they, and, and Mary, and actually Martha, and then Mary come out to confront him. If you had been here, our brother would not have died. And then to Martha, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he calls Lazarus out of the tomb. That is not called a resurrection in, this, in the Bible. And in fact, we understand that Lazarus eventually died again. A person in a hospital room who has, say, uh, some kind of a heart event, uh, isn't that what they're calling them nowadays? We used to say heart attack or maybe this kind of other, they, some kind of a cardiac event may die but be brought back to life by a team of doctors and nurses. We would call that a resuscitation. Somebody goes swimming, they, bring, they get too much water in, they drown. For all intents and purposes, you see what could be a dead body lying there on the shore of a lake or the ocean or whatever. But through the, the uh, work of CPR, they might be resuscitated. That is a resuscitation. Resurrection is not coming back to life to live longer and then to die. Resurrection is a transformation into a higher uh, existence. So the Apostle Paul speaks to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 through 44. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. 
It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. So the message today then is about something to do with a body. A body that died and was buried, but then raised. Not resuscitated like a body in a hotel room, but resurrected and changed. It is, I think, for this reason that the early church chose the butterfly as one of its symbols. I don't know, you guys may have seen this before. I remember my younger days going to the Christian bookstores and they have little symbols and, and necklaces and rings and stickers and things, symbols of Christianity. And of course, the cross is one of them. The fish is one of them. But so is the butterfly. Why is that? Well, I mean, obvious reasons, right? A caterpillar uh, at some point or some stage in its life will attach itself to a limb or something and weave a chrysalis around it. You want me to say cocoon, right? Cocoons are for moths. Just, I'm not trying to be a snob here. But a butterfly weaves a, a chrysalis around itself and after a period of time, it emerges a beautiful butterfly transformed from the caterpillar to the butterfly. In the same way, the earthly body dies and it is buried just like Jesus died and was buried. But it will be transformed. It will be resurrected just as Jesus was resurrected. And if we had, you know, all afternoon, we would quote passages of Scripture where Jesus is referred to by Paul and others in the New Testament as the firstborn from among the dead. What Jesus demonstrated to us in his resurrection is what we will be in our resurrection. Again, to quote Paul, for this perishable, perishable body must put on imperishability and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Nine days ago on Good Friday, Ann and I learned that a friend of ours had died of COVID-19. She was younger than we are, actually. She had been in the hospital for several weeks, seemed to have a little bit of improvement, and then uh, she, she just died. Her husband is one of my best friends, and in fact, some of you have met him because he spoke here about three years ago, if you remember. She is the second of two of our former co-workers who have died in the last six weeks of COVID. So naturally, this hits home just a little bit, right? Because we're thinking, I knew that person. I uh, probably all of us know someone who has died from coronavirus. All of us at least know of somebody who knows somebody. But now it's like people that we used to work with who are in our age group. So that's a little, that feels a little different, you know. So naturally, such losses, they hit home and cause us to reflect on the fragility of life and the uncertainty of the times that we are now living in. When death comes close like this, it causes us to think heavy thoughts, doesn't it? Heavy thoughts about what we believe about this life and whether there is a life to follow. Is this all there is? Will Dan and Haley and JT ever see Stephanie again, as they hope to do? We say yes, we believe it. But we all know that the death of a loved one, the death of a friend, often disturbs our confidence. And what argument is strong enough to convince us that we are right? 
Well, I do remember a great argument for life after death. It is only that. It's just a sort of a metaphor. But I heard Rabbi Blumenthal quote it a number of times, and I want to share it with you now. He simply asked, does an unborn child know that there is a world to come? Does an unborn child know that there is an existence after the one that it is currently experiencing? Now, let's just flesh that thought out a little bit. We can imagine that a child in its mother's womb, if it's a healthy pregnancy, is warm, is well-fed, it's getting a, an abundant supply of blood and oxygen and all the, the necessaries for existence. What should that child expect more than what it already has? And yet we know that there, we know better. We know that outside of the womb are sunshine and mountains and trees and all kinds of food to enjoy and people, other people to experience through physical contact and eye contact and, and conversation. An unborn child, for instance, has not yet experienced a baseball game or a first date or potty training for that matter, right? In the same way, no matter how great we think this life is that we are currently experiencing, no matter what we, how complex we think it is, or, or even if we are unable to imagine anything greater, it is conceivable that there is something better, right? If we look at the world in which we live, the law of entropy is very much in effect. Our health fails. Our bodies fail. We may feel moments of mortality that maybe this is all there is and that we have one life to live and then it is over. But we also believe that things could be better. And to this, the Gospels demonstrate that there is a resurrection body and that Jesus appeared in that resurrection body to many witnesses, to his disciples, and they not only witnessed his resurrection, but they took that message and they spread it throughout the world. And it is the reason that we are here today. Even though they failed to recognize him at first sight, they recognized him through his words and deeds. The resurrected Jesus was not less than they remembered. And to me, this is a key point. The, the resurrected Jesus was not less. He was more. We might even say that he was too much for them to comprehend. And this is the perspective I believe that the resurrection of Jesus places upon us. Or if you may recall two weeks ago, I stated on Palm Sunday, the key takeaway from our text today is not that our expectations are too high or too great, but that they are too small. Could it be that we are sometimes like those two disciples on the road to Emmaus? Could we be walking with the risen Jesus and fail to notice it? Could we be like Mary who saw the empty tomb, who heard the announcement of the angels, who said that he is alive and still be looking for a dead body? And could we be like the disciples who just go back to our, you know, our original occupation, fishing on the Sea of Galilee, and see Jesus on the shore, and obey his instructions, and witness a miracle, and still be slow to understand? Of course we can. We are often slow to understand. But sooner or later, each one of us will have an encounter with the risen Jesus, an encounter with the sublime, 
And it will be an opportunity to respond in faith to a reality that is greater, higher, and more real than the one that we currently understand. And in that moment, will we have the eyes of faith to recognize and acknowledge Christ, the risen Lord? I pray that we shall. And how appropriate that our closing hymn, three simple words, trust and obey. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn. I invite you to see Christ with the eyes of faith, the resurrected Christ who will raise us from this perishable, earthly, mortal life to immortality. Shall we respond in faith as we sing? Amen. And you have shown your trust and obedience by worshiping today and being faithful in church. And I don't just mean those of you who are here, but those of you who are with us online, either now at this moment or later in the day, later in the week. Faithfulness in worship is uh, such a key part of the Christian life. Thank you for doing that with us. As always, thank you to the choir for uh, enhancing our worship with song with our minister of music Ann Edmondson for enhancing our worship through music and in coordinating all of this the dream team in the back we've got Saul and Raymond and Jim as usual and then uh, now Don Cheryl back there lending his expertise so it's uh, the dream team has become dreamier would you believe yeah. Yeah. thank you to um, Marsha Moore for being our Elder and worship leader today, thank you to Peggy for being Service Guild. Um, and my, uh, online, our um, webmaster, Nate Martin, who is uh, always making sure that the video gets onto our website, also the manuscript. So um, these days I'm printing up a manuscript and I'm sending him a copy of it and he's posting it on our website. So if you go to firstchristianatlanta.org, the top where the pull down menus are there's one that says messages if you click on it you can actually find the manuscript and you'll see that i do go off manuscript from time to time but anyway it's there in case you prefer to read rather than to listen anyway pray that you continue to walk in the easter uh message that christ is raised and he's not a body that was raised to the same existence, but to a higher existence, just as we too shall be raised with him. I believe the number we have today is 33 in the building. 
34. Okay, or is that just four? I think I count more than four people. Yeah, 34. Thank you. <laughs> well, Jim, you do count. You're important. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul this day and all days. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.